with the Dynasty King Edward VII and the Queen at Belmoral Castle. And uh, the King, through his son Edward, had heard all about scats. Remember, guiding hadn't been thought of at this stage. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, there was a knock on the door, knock on the door, and it was the King's Edward who came to the Big Buster, sir, you want to buy his majesty the king right now, and I mean now. Anyway, grandfather is in military uniform, he's just putting on his medals and decorations, and he had one or two just quietly, <laughs> and uh, he put his medals on, King Equity helped him a little bit along the way, and uh, as they raced out through the corridor down to the king's special chambers, the equity explained. So uh, we were about to have dinner, and the problem is, um, is that your dinner card, where you're, where you're going to see, sit down, it refers to you as Major General Sir Robert Baden Powell. There's only one minor problem, sir. The problem is, you're not knighted yet. So His Majesty the King knighted Baden Powell, Sir Robert, before dinner instead of after. Uh, yes, normally it was been done after, but you know, Baden Powell's philosophy was very simple. He was convinced, totally convinced, that the future prosperity and sustaining of world peace lay in the hands of young people. Based on this principle, we further developed his idea by holding an experiment, a social experimental camp on the little island called Rowdy Island, which is just to the south coast of Britain in August 1907. From these humble beginnings, the scouting and eventually guiding idea grew very rapidly, to the extent that the movement, and I include the girl guides as well, it grew and was established in something like 218 countries and territories with an estimated membership of some 40 million, including, of course, our sister movement, the Girl Guide Association. Clearly, there is no question that uh, we have a very, very, very serious membership in anybody's language. Since its inception, the movement now enjoys a very proud history of achievement, at which has received recognition from a number of institutions such as the Nobel Peace Institute, UNESCO, and so on. In fact, it was in 19, 1939 BP was actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, but due to the outbreak of World War II, there was no award made in that particular year. To its promise of the law, and the problem to its promise and the law, of ten, all ten points of it, scouting and guiding sets high demands on its membership, and as a result, the movement has successfully gained a very wide and high community respect globally, particularly amongst business and government sectors throughout the world. Considering the background that lay behind the involvement of, the, of both guiding and scouting, it is absolutely amazing that both movements ever got off the ground in the first place. The fact are that the movement was started by a middle-aged, retired military officer, a bachelor who had little to do with young people except train young men for war. Yet, yet, this is the extraordinary thing, yet out of the horrors of war, he created what could be arguably um, argued the world's largest youth movement, and no question the, the world's greatest peace movement. There is no doubt in my mind about that. Essentially, BP had a dream, and he possessed that unique ability to be able to communicate those ideas very successfully with others. Through his writings and through his personal example, BP was able to accuse, yes, millions of people in all parts of the world simply by catching their imagination with an idea, and they responded brilliantly. At that time, BP saw no point in the then rigid social class structures 
that existed in Great Britain at the time. Fundamentalists, he believed that each young person held similar views and had outlooks, uh, very similar outlooks, when it came to the bottom line. He believed that every young person should have the right, yes, the right, to a decent education. And above all, look, be, uh, be given the opportunity that life's opportunities uh, offered people at the time. So he set out to prove his theory by holding his experimental camp on Ramsey Island, which is a small island off the south coast of Britain. As you've already heard Zidane say, 20 young people, young boys, from young men I should say, randomly chosen from a cross section of British society to, uh, to join this camp for 10 days. Some of the boys came from very poor East End of London. Some of the boys came from some of the great schools, such as Eton, Charterhouse, Harrow, just to name a few. He brought them together, he mixed them up like peas in a pudding. He brought them together really to see just how they would react. And they reacted brilliantly. Since Bramsey, the experiment, since the Bramsey experiment, the movement has influenced and felt the shape, shape the lives of a countless number of people of varying ages from all walks of life, irrespective of colour, class, or creed. Meeting so many scouting and driving people as I do from around the world, I have that I have come across one outstanding feature that seems to lose through. That is their infectious enthusiasm, their genuine warmth of feeling, and their deep sense of pride at having the opportunity to participate in this unique thing called guiding and scouting. Yes, the guiding and scouting experience. Essentially, the movement's aim is to help develop young people so that they can maybe useful, full and fun-filled lives by offering and encouraging participation through a variety of activities that are both appealing, thought-provoking and most importantly, character building. With the objective of young people that should take their place in society in a meaningful way, thus become responsible members of their community. Which I'm sure you're all Yes, it was just on a hundred years ago. My grandfather, by this time, remember, he was not married yet. My grandfather attended a rally at Crystal Cuts. And while he was there, he was accosted by young women, there's 12 of them, who were wearing sort of scout uniforms, they had scarves on them, wearing hats. And my grandfather, I would imagine, would have said something like this. What the devil do you think you're doing? Well, sir, I said, simple full day, look at Kennedy. Uh, we want to do what our brothers do. Go camping, tie knots, do first day, do this, do that, and so on. And do you now? So he turned down to his sister, Agnes, at the time. And he said, Agnes, what are you going to do about this? Or something like that, I can imagine. In short, the inspiration for the Girl Guide movement was, in fact, the founder's sister, Agnes Baden Powell, who was indeed a very remarkable woman. And I don't believe she should ever be forgotten. And with her brother, deserved recognition for creating, arguably, the world's greatest movement for women, the Girl Guide movement. Be as it may, it cannot be denied that my late grandmother, Lady Olive, played a vital role in the guided movement's continued development and critical time when the then fledgling movement appeared to be faltering slightly from the end. It was Olive's youthful zest of challenge, her enormous sense of energy, and above all, her total belief in the principles of the guide law, and indeed the promise that she took at the time of her, in the, of, of her investiture. In a sense, both Agnes and I complemented each other's enormous sense of foresight and belief in the rights of women. And that's what we're talking about today, isn't it? The empowerment of women. 
There can be no doubt, as a devoted sister and beloved wife of the founder, each of these ladies made a significant contribution in establishing the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts, better known to all of us as WAGs. Agnes was indeed a most unusual person, considering her background at the time she was born. The norm for a young woman of those days, of those days was to be presented at court. Traditionally, she would have been expected to become accomplished in the arts, music, and so on. But I suppose having six, uh, having six very uh, outgoing brothers, she of course did what they did. That is, she did the unwomanly like thing, or lady like thing. She went camping. Yes, she went sailing. She went swimming. Horror, horror, horror for Victorian England at that time. And this was the daughter of the university professor, come clergy, in the Church of England, who died while she was very young, after her father's death. And as only daughter, she played out the role of dutiful daughter by living in her mother's shadow right up to her brother's death. Sadly, as a result, Agnes never married, even though a number of opportunities existed. Agnes had little formal education, yet she developed an inquiring mind. Thanks to her brothers, she became interested in unladylike activities, as I said earlier. Not only in camping, but especially in flying. And after the hostilities of World War II, she, wants to, she expressed the wish to uh, learn to fly this new flying contraption called an helicopter. She was then 18 years of age, quite a remarkable person. She was also the only female member of the Royal Aeronautical Society, uh, which was most unusual in those days. And she once held the she once held the height record because of her balloon experiences thanks to her, oh, her younger brother, Major Baden, Fetch a Smile at Baden who was an acknowledged balloonist in his day. She developed an interest in the thing called radio and became friendly with Mark Hogan, the man who invented radio. We believe Agnes may well have taken part in some of Mark Hogan's early experiments. In spite of her busy life, she still found time to write and publish the first handbook for girl guides, How Girls Can Help Build the Empire. There is no question of doubt, both Agnes and Ole Bateau were extraordinary ladies who were women of their time and before their time. We owe them both a great debt of gratitude. Now we will have a short video, a DVD rather, which I hope you will enjoy. It's called 100 Years of Scouting, but of course it does refer to Phil Guys as well. <laughs> 